Good morning, everybody. I uh, love that song by Daniel Namad. What if the race is over? Um, I like the words, the answer comes back to me in the end, because that's really what it's all about. That we are the arbiters of our lives. I title my message today, Eschatological Exegesis, because, well, Joshua came up with that title in a meeting. I think it was, maybe we both put it together, I don't know. So I decided to explore it. Eschatology is the study of the end times in biblical, interpret, uh, biblical literature. And exegesis simply means biblical interpretation. Books like the book of Daniel, uh, book of Revelation, in the Bible, uh, describe the end time on earth for humanity. Uh, and of course, these old books have been taken way out of context because there is no real end. Uh, humans, when we are done on this planet, it will keep spinning and our brother son will decide when everything in our solar system is, is good and done for. Fractals and circles tell us that there are really no beginnings and no endings, that a beginning is an end and an end is a beginning. So what I'm left with here with this title, exe uh, Eschatological Exegesis, what I'm left here is with just a clever play on words to pique your interest in the sermon today. I, I don't know if it worked or not. But uh, today I want to study and interpret our end goal as human beings, human beings and as a congregation. How can we be and become the beloved community? What is our end goal? What is your end goal? To be happy, to be content, to be at peace? What is the end goal for you? Fractals are patterns of evolution. And if you look up the Fibonacci sequence, it's a numbering sequence. I'll probably go into that in another sermon. Uh, but if you look it up, you can see this mathematical pattern emerge in nature. In fact, it is how things evolve. Now, if you do not separate yourself from nature, and I don't, if you are nature, I am nature, then you can see that you're a part of this sort of cosmic formulation. In the Fibonacci sequence, the numbers start out small and then spiral out infinitely, as far as we know. Things start out small and then they become larger. And if you look at nature, the same biology in the small is in the large, the same creative forces are in the patterns repeating at scale. Now, how do you know that you're not changing the world right where you are? Right now, if everything is repeating at scale. So if I am nature, then I repeat patterns. I repeat at scale. What I do with those close to me is what I do with those foreign to me. If I fix myself, I fix the world. So the end is the beginning and everything brings us, brings us back to ourselves. That's what Joseph Campbell said about the myths. They bring us back to ourselves. And those of us with children, our children, our families are fractal patterns of us a spiritual practice of going within allows one to identify the positive and negative fractal patterns that emerge as a result of our domestication, our mechanized habits due to our socialization. The cool part about being a conscious evolving human being is that we can become aware of these patterns and we can change the negative pattern, patterns towards something that is more healthy and, and positive which, by the way, is what I believe the purpose of human life is, to transmute negative energy into 
the positive internally and externally. So we project our habits, our domestication, our socialization onto everyone in our spheres of influence. We leave a little piece of ourselves wherever we go and who knows whether our energy stays wherever we are you know, and wherever we leave. Who knows how that affects time, places, and circumstances. But the founder of Taoism, Lao Tzu, he said, if there is to be peace in the nation, there must be peace in the home. If there is to be peace in the home, there must be peace within the person, within the parents, within the children. Fix yourself, fix your family. Fix your family, fix your community. Fix your community, fix your nation. Fix your nation, fix your planet. This often comes back to me when things aren't working out so well for me, whether it be my work life, my spiritual life, my personal life. And that's why this week on Facebook, if you noticed, I put pictures up of all five of my children, three biological and two stepkids. I talked about uh, them last week, as a matter of fact, because I'm really into fractal geometry right now fractal biology. And I wanted to give them a shout out because they are patterns, fractal patterns of Joni and I. They represent each of us. They are a part of us. And having five children, you learn a lot about what you're not doing so well. And they teach me, uh, teach us to practice non-judgment and compassion and active listening, and I try my best not to blame, and I try my best to practice letting go daily. And when I'm frustrated or mad or afraid, I ask myself, where is that coming from? Why is this bothering me so much? And this has made a huge difference in my attitude toward living, and loving. You know, I chased happiness and peace for so long, and I never found it while chasing, while chasing. I found it in stillness. Years ago, when I met Reverend Fred, he asked a young, ambitious minister, when is enough enough? And that has stuck with me over the years. He wasn't discouraging me. He knew that I was already active in the community, working for social justice, working with racial equity and marriage equality, but he sensed something else, a dis-ease. And I had to think to myself, what was the reason I was doing all of this? Was I doing it for the right reasons, ministry? I thought about it. And later on, I heard a still small voice say to, my, say to me, when will you stop racing and chasing? When will you start being who you are? And I sat with that. About two years later, that voice began to emerge again, but it was a high point. I was selected to be the 2012 General Assembly Speaker in Phoenix, Arizona. A high point, young minister about to speak before 4,000 people, give the Sunday sermon. Preparing for it was exciting. Some of you remember that time, Reverend Fred, Reverend Christina, Reverend Anastasia, who was an intern back then, they all participated in the service. We showed our UUCA best. It's a lot of work, a lot of preparation. And when I was done giving that sermon and I looked up tears in my eyes, there were 4,000 UUs on their feet, standing ovation. Wow, my dream has come true. MLK would be proud. But afterward, slowly, found myself in depression. And for the first time in my life, I didn't have anything 
to chase. The thrill that I was expecting wasn't quite what I had in mind. And I had to reassess my ministry and my reasons for doing what I was doing. Why was I working in the community? Why was I doing mentoring? Yeah, it was a part of my job, but I helped design my job. And it hit me that I was doing these things because I thought that's what I was supposed to do. I thought it would make me feel like a minister. And there I was, depressed. And that's when my ministry turned from outside in to inside out. I went from ego-based ministry to faith-based ministry. And I decided to do what I felt called to do and not what others expected me to do. I realized I was doing what Brene Brown calls hustling for your worth. That worth should come right here, not from out there. That's the gravy on the, on the steak or veggies. But there I was hustling and my tank was empty. And it hit me that the chase for the carrot never ends. And we can chase and chase and chase until our soul leaves our body. I had chased in my early life as an entrepreneur and as an advertising sales executive. I was doing it now in my young ministerial life. And after all of that chasing, I still was worried and fearful and tired. And there had to be a better way. And I can't tell you when in my spiritual life it happened, but that still small voice began to speak and said, John, there is no there there. Each there is just a new starting point for some other thing to chase after. You will never be satisfied. What you're looking for is love and acceptance unconditionally, and that is found within. I know you want to save the world, but why? What is that about? Deep-seated need for fairness and justice. Oh, yes. Who are you trying to prove yourself to? A lot of what I did was what others expected me to do. And that still small voice, I trust it. Save yourself first. Help the people that are right in front of you. That's your family. That's your congregation. That's your community. Like a spiral pattern from small to large. I'm not saying you can't go work in the community and, you know, wait, I got to get everything figured out. Then you can go. I'm not, no, that's not it. But it's about being present with your life and realizing that beloved community is found in moments. And so many of us want to get out there and fight so much ignorance. So much, so much toxicity. I want to fight too. But faith is about trust. And trust is about listening to your higher self. And my higher self said to me, the work will come to you. And when it does, you will know it because it is your work. And because it is your work, you will find joy even amidst the sorrow. Some of us wish to be content, but we feel bad or guilty about all those suffering around us. And I get it, amen. 
As loving people, we should feel others' pain. That's empathy. But perhaps the message is the same for you. Help those right in front of you. Help the ones that come to you. Help those that ask for help. Don't force your love on anyone. That's toxic charity. <clears throat> and it almost never works because it robs others of their free will to choose. A person convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. So many times we're giving and doing because of guilt and that is the wrong spirit. We give when we can to those who come to us because we recognize it as holy work. When we go to others and they ask for our help and they share with us what is, is exactly they're looking for, that we stay in relationship with them. We give from a space of love and generosity, not from a space of ego and winning awards and being on stage and getting a standing ovation. That's the gravy. Like this week, some of you get it. Most of you get it. I, all of you get it. It's an amazing congregation. But some of you this week answered the call. Family lost their home in Robin Wood, burned down. I'm flipping open the paper on Thursday, and there it is, Unitarian Universalist Church. Apparently that family got a whole lot. They needed a lot, and they got a lot because the community answered the call. That excites me more than busy work. There was our church mentioned in the paper. Thank you for all that you do. You represent your love and our love every time you do, every time you go out in the community and you do something with the right intention. And the same thing is true when uh, some of you started the outdoor food pantry. There's a sister from the community that posts every week on our Facebook page about the good work that this church is doing for families, we're helping marginalized communities. Thank you. This is the work that's right in front of us. And as a local congregation, I feel that is our most pressing and important work. So today's message is really me sharing with you that I know what my ministry is now. And I am not confused nor depressed. I have clarity. I am a pastoral minister, a life coaching minister, a teaching minister. That is sometimes out fighting for social justice as I am called. It took chasing ambition. It took prostate cancer to find it. But I know what my ministry is now. We are, help, we are, I, I, we are all here to help build a congregation built on the enduring principle of love and not fear. I'm here with our Minister of Equal Standing, Reverend Anastasia Zinke, to help build a congregation that continues to be a local force for good. We're here with people who are choosing to be self-aware and self-organizing and woke and all the struggle that comes with that. People who know that to change the world, we must change ourselves. 
my ministry is with and for you. My family first, of course, self-care, then you and your families, then the community and so on and so forth. That's how I align my priorities. And for me, this is more than enough for one lifetime because the work never gets finished. Now, I want you to take this with love, but if you're not happy in the moments, my message for you is to go within and analyze your fractal patterns. You're repeating spirals. Figure out the math that will solve the X's or the unknowns in your life because the small is the large or the large is the small. Everything scales. Fractal biology or what Adrian Marie Brown calls biomimicry. Mimicking biological science means we do what nature does. And in the coming weeks, Reverend Anastasia and I are going to be discussing her book more to look at organisms and organizations that are resilient. She will help us to see that systems based on predatory practices will eventually become extinct, like lions, tigers, and bears. Oh, my. And things like mushrooms and ants and ferns Roaches, dandelions are resilient organisms and we should be modeling our lives, our systems after them. And what does that look like? We're gonna talk about that. Of course, I never thought I'd compare myself to a roach, <laughs> but it makes sense to me. Like me, Miss Brown had her own awakening experience. After all the protests and activism, she felt that same emptiness and realized during a retreat with nature that happiness is found in aspirations, of course, but also in everyday inspirations. And that the everyday is what sustains the someday. The everyday is what sustains the someday. And both your ministers share this belief. In fact, last month, we, Reverend Anastasia and I met for 10 hours in January to discuss the vision of UUCA and what we mean by the words beloved community, and some interesting things emerged. I mentioned some of those things a few weeks ago. Since then, we have shared our preliminary thoughts with the board, and they have given us their blessing to keep moving forward and exploring the etymology and semantics behind the words that we use in our congregation. Exciting stuff. Beloved community, consider this that we are part of a beloved community. Now break that down. This sums up every human that lives, that wants to be, have a sustainable life. First, we want to be, to be or not to be. That is the question. We want to exist. We want to be seen and heard. We want to be ourselves. As Jesse Jackson said, I am somebody then we want to be loved. Yes. And we want community to commune, to come together with a common purpose, with common values and hopes. Beloved community is a place where we can be, where we can experience love, where we can exist as a community of mutuality and respect. We also discussed that there are experiences when we have 
felt beloved community. And we name those feelings and values. Those words are on your screen. We agreed that when you experience these values or feelings or attributes in a particular time, place or circumstances, you are having a community, a beloved community moment. So we pulled it all, pulled it all together and we put together a definition. The beloved community or beloved community is an inspiration and aspiration which exists inside of us and this congregation and it exists outside of us and this congregation. When we are in relational spaces of mutuality, connection, nonviolence, honesty, true trust, authenticity, equity, liberation, action, and so on and so forth, you see those words. But what about fighting for justice? What about racial equity? Ah, yes, important work, and we must continue to do that. But that is the means to the end, and we're talking about the end goal. Now, even though, of course, there is no end, ends are new beginnings, beginnings are new ends. It's a continuation, a circle. But in terms of organizational goals, we do have ends. And our end is about living at our highest good as human beings. Our end is when we are living at a time where we transcend injustices. You see, every time you are in a space where you don't have to worry about your race or gender or sexual orientation, and you feel loved and seen and heard and accepted, you are in beloved community. You are having a BC moment. I have experienced these moments. And all of them have not come during joyful times. The one I want to point out as I close happened during tragedy. When Wendy Winters was murdered. You remember, there we were shocked and crushed in disbelief. But we had to keep going. We had a vigil at the church for Wendy. Remember all the national media had descended on us that evening because her children were planning to come to the service. And Reverend Fred was there too. And I remember him telling me how surreal that night was. And I had to be strong. So I thought. I tried, but as the service went on, the testimonies, the wailing, the deep hurt, the sadness, it just took its toll on the entire room, me included. I looked on the front row and there was Fred. Of course, he had been retired. This was his first time back to UUCA, such a time as that was. But there he was. I could see everyone in the room from my vantage point. But it was Fred who triggered me. His hands were over his face. And he was, he was hunched over and sobbing. And I was not able to hold my composure after that. But out of nowhere, this hand on my back, I turned around with tears welling in my eyes and it was Charlotte Wallace, a nurse by day, but my savior in that moment. She'd somehow come up to the stage. She knew what I needed. And I stood up and gave her a hug, a long hug. And I sobbed and I, 
I let it all out. But in that moment, I knew that you were my people. I knew that we were in this together, that I was your minister. I knew that I was loved and cared for. The love of community comes in small and large ways, but if you miss the small, you won't see the large. It's a day-to-day -day experience and a hopeful vision for our world. But it also starts with seeing beloved community in the mundane and the plain. The presence of another human body, <clears throat> the kind words, the hug, the gentle kiss, the smile, a cup of coffee or tea, the sympathy card, the shared tears. That's the end goal. Love, hallelujah. That's what's right in front of you every day. That's the love supreme that Miles Davis understood. And that is what the human fractal is all about. Manifest love. Amen.